will grace to you in peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. Amen. As we begin this evening, I want you to consider for a moment just how often we are confronted with the image of the cross. Think about for a moment the many places you might see it, you might wear it, or you might even put it up for display. Many of you as you came into worship this evening is wearing a cross, maybe a necklace, a shirt, or maybe even a tattoo. And as we travel through town, we see the symbol of the cross on church signs, on buildings, marking medical facilities, and many other places. Or maybe your thoughts turn to your own home where you have a cross hanging on the wall or a crucifix. We are confronted all over the place with the image of the cross. It's constantly before our eyes and especially as Christians in the church. And I dare say it is a good thing that it's so prevalent to us. Yet tonight, this Good Friday, we are invited to look once again at the cross to move from those symbols of gold and silver, of wood, of paint and ink, and look squarely at what they symbolize. Tonight in our gospel reading, St. Luke gives you and I a picture of that cross, an image for us to consider this evening. And our reading begins at the sixth hour, and it will continue through to the ninth hour. And he will paint for us what it looks like at the moment of the death of Christ. And the scene that Luke is going to be painting for us this evening is a brutal one. In this short passage, Luke helps us to see the background of the picture and all that's going on. The very creation itself appears to be wounded and not working in the way that it's intended to. The light, the very sun itself, grows dim and seems to fail. A distance away from the cross, a great curtain hanging in the temple is split in two. And at that moment, with a loud voice, Jesus calls out, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And with that, Jesus dies. Yet the picture that Luke gives for our consideration today continues. He turns his attention from the background and Christ on the cross to those who are gathered at the foot of the cross. He turns his attention first to this unnamed Roman centurion who's been a witness to today's events. The centurion has seen Jesus led away from the city bearing his own cross. He watches as lots are cast for Jesus' clothing. He sees him nailed to the cross. He watches Jesus refuse to hurl insults and to ask forgiveness for those who would do these acts to him. He even sees Jesus offering paradise to the criminal by his side. And to all of this, the only words that come from his mouth as he looks upon the body of Jesus is, certainly this man was innocent. Next, Luke tells us of the crowds who surround the foot of the cross, the crowds that demanded him be crucified and Barabbas released, the crowds that spit and mocked Jesus as they made their way to Golgotha, the crowds that jeered and hurled insults at Jesus as he died. And Luke tells us these crowds were assembled for a spectacle, but in our picture this evening of the cross, they are seen leaving beating their chests. After seeing everything that had taken place and realizing their direct participation in these events, they leave in utter shame and guilt. Finally, our reading directs us to see Jesus' acquaintances and the women who had followed him from Galilee standing a little further off from all of these events. We cannot imagine the feelings of these witnesses as Jesus, the one they had seen do miraculous things, is now dead. And they are left there to deal with the consequences of the last few days. As Joseph of Arimathea, who as Luke tells us, was a member of the council, a good and righteous man who had not consented to their decisions and actions. In fact, he was a man looking for the kingdom of God. He and the others hastily remove Jesus from the cross and they quickly bury him in a tomb hewn from the stone. The cross might always be in our vision, but tonight we see fully what it is. We see the brutal nature to the cross. 
And for us today, as we gather to remember these events, what does the image of the cross that Luke has for us mean for us in our contemplation of Jesus' death this evening? I think the startling words of the centurion still ring true today. Certainly, this man was innocent. As we look upon Jesus on that cross, the same words come from our mouths this evening. Here upon that tree is Christ our Lord, the blameless Son of the living God. We followed his life as we read through the Gospels. We've seen his miracles, his teachings, his interactions with others. No sin, no crime, no evil is about him, yet here is capital punishment. Here our innocent Lord is crucified among criminals, among sinners, yet here I am. Here we are, the guilty, looking upon the innocent sufferings of Jesus. And the shame and the guilt of the crowds that surround Jesus is our guilt and shame. It's not our cries to Pontius Pilate that has driven Jesus to the cross, but rather the innocent Son of God suffers for our sins. Our sins are put on the one true innocent man. We sin as we betray and turn our back on God as we worship things and people, idols over the one true God. We sin against our God as we misuse his name, not for prayer and praise, but for falsehood and evil. We sin against our God as we despise his word and the gathering of the saints. And upon him is also placed the sin and evil we experience amongst ourselves, our rebellion under authority our hatred for our neighbor in our heart, our lust that we can't keep in check, our greed that drives us to hurt others, the words that we speak that tear down others, and the jealous nature of our hearts. Here is the ugly truth of the cross. Here as we look upon the cross, we see our failure to love both God and our neighbor. We beat our chest in guilt and shame. And here, too, we see the consequences of our sin. We see death. As wrath that is rightly due us is poured out on the Lamb of God, death. Here, truly, we see the punishment that is due our own sinful ways. Here is not the consequences of a state-ordered execution, but the consequences of our sinful thoughts, words, and deeds. Here we see the death that is due our own sin that each of us is due. The image of the cross as we look at it from Luke's perspective is brutal. We see the innocent Son of God, Christ Jesus our Lord, suffering for our sin and dying in our place. And Tonight, as we hear the scriptures tell us about the suffering and death of our Savior Jesus Christ, how are we to view it all? How are we to look upon this cross and respond? Are we to leave this evening sorrowful and broken? Are we to leave defeated by the victory evil seems to have won this day? Are we to be destroyed by the brutal sight of our own sins and the consequences it has wrought? Tonight, we hear all we are about to hear, and our response in faith is to hope. We look upon the brutality of the image before us and we cling to a true and certain hope that is in Jesus. And the image of the cross also looks different as we change the perspective, as we move from the foot of the cross and the gathered crowds to looking at the cross through the eyes of faith. As we view the cross, the brutality image changes. When we see Christ, the innocent, on the cross, we are invited to see through faith the love of a Savior who would willingly leave his heavenly throne and abandon all and willingly walk to the cross. We see a king, our king, that would choose to suffer all for you and for me. Where we see a brutal image of Christ suffering and dying for our sins, we are invited to see through faith the love of a Savior who bears the burdens of his own people, who takes the punishment and death due to us and in his love for you puts it upon himself. Where we see a brutal image of Christ's death and a tomb that is sealed, 
We're invited to see through faith the destruction of sin, death, and the devil. We see the defeat of evil and the evil in the world this evening as our loving God takes it all to the grave for you and for me. So tonight, as we leave worship in silence, we do so in hope. Tonight, as we once again leave in silence, reflecting on the crucifixion and death of our Savior, we leave hopeful, a hope that assures us that this isn't how the story ends. And it's through this hopeful expectation we hear this evening about the passion of our Lord. And it's in this hopeful expectation that we know that this evil will be used for our good. And it's in Jesus' precious name that we hope and that we pray this evening. Amen.